In this video, we're going to work some example problems where derivatives are applied in real life, real world situations. In the previous video where we went through the textbook, this section of the textbook where it goes into detail on some of these different applications, I mentioned that you want to try not get too bogged down with the scientific or the, or the physical, chemical, the economical details of these questions. It's just more about seeing how the calculus is applied in real life. But also, I know it's difficult if you don't really understand exactly what the physical principle is, then that, then that can make it kind of hard to see how the derivative is being applied. So just do the best you can and don't confuse not understanding the physical principles of the problem that well with not understanding the calculus, right? Don't, don't get confused, right? Don't confuse those two things. Okay. The height in meters of a projectile shot vertically upward from a point two meters above the ground ground level with an initial velocity of 24.5 meters per second is h as a function of t after t seconds. T is in seconds. The projectile, is, it, this is a one-dimensional problem, right? It's strictly the height. It's going up and down. It starts at two meters above ground level at, at a velocity of 24.5 meters per second. It's saying that's the initial velocity and position. So that's at time t is equal to zero. Okay, and in the previous video, we talked about, well, where do you get a position function like this? Well, there's data collection devices that can, that can collect precise, accurate position data of an object at high frequencies. So 50, 100 data points per second. Now you get a bunch of data points. Data points on a graph is not differentiable, but you can do curve fits. Now you don't do a curve fit on the entire data set as a whole. You break it up into pieces, linear pieces, parabolic pieces, curved pieces. And then, and then you just create this piecewise function. And what does piecewise function mean? That sounds like, oh, piecewise, piecewise functions are, are the worst when you're going through math, right? You, we hate piecewise functions. We're uncomfortable with piecewise functions. In, the, in real life, all a piecewise function is, is like in a code or in Excel or, or whatever, you're going to have an if-then statement. If, if T is within this range, then we're working with this function. If T is within this range, we're working with this function. That's it. Well, in real life, it's uh, piecewise functions are easy. It's just an if-then statement to say if we're in this input range, we're doing this. Okay. Find the velocity after two seconds and after four seconds. Velocity is rate of change of position with respect to time. Let's just take the derivative of the position function. So that's 0 plus 24.5 minus, okay, 4.9 times 2, 9.8 T. So that's the velocity at any point in time. And this makes sense, right? When T is equal to zero, the velocity is 24.5. The rate of change, no matter what, if you have a position function, an, an accurate position function, you might be saying, well, why didn't we need to incorporate the 24.5 in, 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 into, into this derivative? They already gave us an accurate position function. You take a position function, if you find its derivative, that's the velocity at that time, because that's what velocity is. It's rate of change of position with respect to time. Okay, so now what is the velocity at time t is equal to two seconds? Plug in two here. So four point nine. meters per second, right? Because time T is in seconds and H is in meters. What about the velocity at, at four seconds? Minus 14.7. What does that mean? Well, the height axis is going up and down. Positive is going up. So that means this is move, This is at four seconds, it's, on, it's moving down. At two seconds, it's on its way up. At four seconds, it's on its way down. When does the projectile reach its maximum height? Well, at maximum height, what happens? The velocity is zero for a moment. So when is H prime equal to zero?
just set the H prime function equal to zero and solve for T. Depending on the type of function you have for H prime, you might have more than one value of T. And that could, that's fine. You might have more than one point where the velocity is zero. But here we're going to just have one point. So, at t is equal to 2.5 seconds. So, okay, let me box the answers in. I probably should have put that h prime of 4 is equal to v of 4. Right, because h prime, the derivative of, of a position function, gives a velocity function. Okay, what is the maximum height? We take the position function and evaluate it at t is equal to 2.5. So, 2 plus... So H 2.5 is 32.6 meters. When does it hit the ground? So I guess we set H is equal to zero and solve for T. Yeah, because it starts at two meters above the ground, but so, so whenever T is equal to zero, H is equal to two. So it's so the origin is at ground level. So yeah, set H is equal to zero and solve for T. Okay, so we can use the quadratic formula, minus b, plus or minus, so b squared, 24.5 squared, minus 4 times 4.9 times minus 2, Twenty five point two nine. Okay, divided by two A is nine point eight. So T is equal to twenty four point five plus. 25.29 divided by 9.8, 5.08. That's T1. T2 is equal to 24.5 minus 25.29. O A one seconds, but the negative axis of time is not relevant to this problem, right? We shoot the projectile, so we don't we don't need to consider negative numbers for this problem. So five point at five point oh eight seconds, it's at it it hits the ground. Okay, with what velocity does it hit the ground? Just plug in V or H prime at 5.08. That's
So H prime at five point oh eight minus twenty five point three meters per second. Right, it's minus, it's moving, it's going, the, it's moving down. A company makes computer chips from square wafers of silicon. It wants to keep the side length of a wafer very close to 15 millimeters, and it wants to know how the area A sub X of a wafer changes when the side length X changes. Find A prime of 15 and explain its meaning in this situation. Okay. So... We've got these square wafers. They're square, so the side lengths are x. The area is a, and it's a function of x. A, a, a sub x is x squared. Okay, so the company is, is wanting to know how does the area of a wafer change as the side length changes? in particular, around the, the side length is equal to 15 millimeter mark. So they, they're looking at how does it, you know, when you have a change in delta A with respect to a change in delta X, right? What is that? What is that? That's A sub X2 minus A sub X1 divided by x2 minus x1, because this a sub x is just a function, right? It's a, per, it's a parabola. You can take an x2 and x1, and then there's going to be a corresponding area for that for each for x2 and x1. It's going to be x2 squared and x1 squared. So we start with this, this average change in area with change in x. But what we want to do is we want to say, we want to take the limit of this as delta x approaches zero. We want to find that the, the change in area with respect to x at 15 millimeters, at a point. Well, what is this? This is d a d x, right? This is how, like, in a scientific paper or a real world problem, this is this is how they'll they'll set it up. You know, from like a fundamentals of calculus standpoint, they they have a difference quotient, and they're saying, okay, we have this difference quotient. Where this is the, in general what we're trying to analyze this change in one variable with respect to another variable, well, let's take the limit as the denominator variable goes to zero. And this is, this is, a, this is, this is one form of the definition of a derivative. So what is dA dx? It's 2x, right? This is a prime. So now it wants to know what's a prime of 15. a prime of 15 is equal to 30. Now, 30 what? Well, the, the units of a derivative is just the, it's this unit divided by this unit. So square meters divided by meters. And so I'll leave it just square meters per meter. I could, I could cancel that and say just meters, but I think it's more intuitive to say that, to look at it like it's for every, or, or no, it's square millimeters square millimeters per millimeter. Again, I could cancel this and just have millimeters, but it's more intuitive to say that for every one millimeter increase in side length, the area of the wafer is increasing by 30 square millimeters. This is at when X is equal to 15 millimeters. But you can go in either direction. You could say when X is decreased by one millimeter, the area decreases 30 square millimeters. Right, this x squared here, this this x squared, a x, that's a parabola, and so we're at x is equal to you know somewhere on here, and so we've got this derivative, this slope of this tangent line here. If you go in the positive direction, or you can go in the negative direction, you're analyzing how the area changes when the side length changes, but, but at, at 15 millimeters. Okay. 
Show that the rate of change of the area of a square with respect to its side length is half its perimeter. Try to explain geometrically why this is true by drawing a square whose side length x is increased by an amount delta x. How can you approximate the resulting change in area delta a if delta x is small? Okay, so... We've got x, 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 x. A sub x is equal to x squared. P sub x is equal to 4x. We saw that a prime is 2x. P of x divided by 2 is 2x. So there you go, right? This is this, the rate of change of the area of the square with respect to its side length is a prime. That's 2x. And that's equal to half this perimeter. And then it says, draw a square. Do the, by, explain this geometrically by drawing a square whose side length x is increased by an amount delta x. And then take the limit. I mean, that's what we did. So I don't know. It's kind of asking the same question twice. I mean, how, how else are you going to find the derivative in the beginning? Right? That's the rate of change of the area with respect to the side length. It's delta a divided by delta x. That's the average change over an interval delta x but if we take the limit as delta x approaches zero you get the rate of change at a effectively at a point and that's 2x okay find the average rate of change of the area of a circle with respect to its radius r as r changes from 2 to 3 2 to 2.5 2 to 2.1 okay so we've got a circle radius r and so we're just looking for the average rate of change right they want us to get a feel for the the difference quotient so the area of a circle we know is pi r squared so for case one delta a so we want the average rate of change of the area of a circle with respect to its radius r. Average rate of change of the area with respect to the radius. It's the average, because it's, 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 it's not like, we're not taking the limit as delta r goes to zero. That's what the difference quotient is. It's the average change of one variable with respect to another, the average. So delta a is pi times three squared minus pi times 2 squared over 3 minus 2. This is pi times 3 squared minus 2 squared over 1. So this is 9 minus 4 is 5, so 5 pi. Okay, now 2 delta A divided by delta R, 2.5 to 2. So pi times 2.5 squared minus 2 squared over 2.5 minus 2, 0.5. So... Four point five pi. Okay, now three we've got pi two point one squared minus two squared over two point one minus two is zero point one. So 2.1 squared minus 4 divided by 0 0.1, 4.1 .1 pi. Okay, so what they're doing is they're, we have each time we've got two, but I guess we're, we're getting the, the x2, the start, the, the x2 here, or the f of x, yeah, x2 or f of x2, same, you know, the same idea. The x2 is getting closer and closer to 2 each time. 
right? That's kind of how the idea, you, the difference quotient, you're, you're making the delta, the delta variable in the denominator smaller and smaller is effectively what you're doing. So this looks to be approaching four pi, which yeah, it is because that's the area of the circle when r is equal to two. But we're just trying to get the feel for this difference quotient. Find the instantaneous rate of change when r is equal to two. Instantaneous rate of change. Well, no, we're not, the area of the circle is not, I guess it's just a coincidence that delta A delta divided by delta R is approaching four pi, which happens to also be the area of the circle when R is equal to two. We're not calculating the area of the circle here. We're calculating this delta A divided by delta R. So, but anyway, so the limit as delta R approaches zero of a difference quotient, this is one of the definitions of the derivative. It's D A D R. What is D A D R? Well, well, we need a differentiable function for the area of a circle as, as a function of R. Well, that's pi R squared. So two pi R. So what is D A D R when R is equal to two? Two pi times two. 4 pi. And again, that's just a coincidence that this happens to be the area of the circle. This is dA dr. All right, show that the rate of change of the area of a circle with respect to its radius at any r is equal to the circumference of the circle. Well, yeah, that's what we, that's what we just got here. dA dr is equal to 2 pi r is equal to the circumference. Right, 2 pi r is the circumference of a circle, pi d. Try to explain geometrically why this is true by drawing a circle whose radius is increased by an amount delta r. Okay, so what they want us to do is take, you know, we increase delta r just a bit. That's not the best. Let me... Okay, when you go from this, from this area to this area, what, what's the change, right? What's delta A? Delta A is, is this. This area, right? The area of this entire second circle, the whole area, minus the area of this entire first circle is just this area. Well, as, de as, as, Delta R approaches zero. What's that approaching? The 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 the, the, the original circle, the, the first circle. That's where R is, right? You have R and R plus delta R. R is the radius of the first circle. Newton's law of gravitation says that the magnitude F of the force exerted by a body of mass M on the body of mass M. So this is the, the smaller body. This is the larger body. Is this? So there's a video in the physics playlist where we talk about Newton's law of gravitational attraction, where G is the gravitational constant and R is the distance between the bodies. So find DF DR and explain its meaning. What does the minus sign indicate? So we've got a function here. It gives its force as a function of these variables. Okay. But M is going to be a constant, lowercase m, uppercase m, and capital G are all constants. So, so F is strictly a function of R, of R. Now, remember how we talked about if we're going to be taking a derivative, behind any derivative you take in the real world is a differentiable function. What's differentiable mean? So, you know, a smooth, continuous curve. So you just have to think about this is a differentiable function here. Is, is it? G, capital G, all these weird variables. Is this differentiable? Absolutely. Constant, 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 divided by R squared. This is, you, if you're, you're going to plot F as a function of R, you're going to get some smooth curve. Well, at, at R is equal to zero, it's undefined, but everywhere else you're going to get a smooth curve, smooth, differentiable curve. So we, we, this is no problem. We, just, we know how to find F prime of R. We just, as long as we have the function, f as a function of r, it's no problem. df dr is not a problem at all. 
Now just take note if for some reason G was a function of R, M was a function of, or, or any of these M's were a function of R, if, if for some reason, then you couldn't, you couldn't take the derivative and, and keep those constant because you, you need to know exactly how F it varies as a function of R. And if these are a function of R, well, you need to know how are they a function of R, put that in and, and, and take the whole derivative, right? But these are constants. So we know exactly how F varies as R varies. So we can find DF DR because we have this function. Okay, what is the derivative of, so this is G M M R to the minus two. We get minus two R to the minus three. So that's minus two. Oh no, there's a G in there. So minus two G over R cubed. Okay, so that's DF DR. Now explain its meaning. What does the minus sign indicate? So what this means is R is the the straight line distance between like the center of, of the of the two objects. If you change that distance a little bit, that that distance between the objects, how does the, the the force change? That's what it's telling you, and it's minus because if the objects get closer, so here you've got the two objects. Here's the the forces. And then here's the distance. Okay. If the objects get closer, the force increases. But R is, is in the denominator. Well, okay, R here is in the denominator. So if R decreases, F is increasing, right? They're inversely proportional, right? F and R squared are, is, are inversely proportional. So if R decreases, force increases. So like looking at the graph here, if R increases, force decreases, right? If you get farther away, the force is less. So it's, it's a negative derivative. If they get closer together, R decreases, the force increases. So it's a negative slope. It's a, the derivative is, a, is negative. Suppose it is known that the Earth attracts an object with a force that decreases at the rate of 2 newtons per kilometer when R is equal to 20,000 kilometers. How fast does this force change when R is equal to 10,000 kilometers? Okay, so it, it tells us this first value so we can, we can solve for the, the, the constants, at least the constants multiplied by each other. So because we're trying to get like an exact value for this answer. So... What it's saying is df dr at r is equal to 20,000. And I don't think, yeah, we can use, yeah, the units are fine. So well, I'll put this, okay, is 2, okay? And that's equal to what? Minus 2 g m m divided by well, okay, R cubed is 20,000 cubed. So GMM is equal to 20,000 cubed times 2 divided by minus 2. Well, okay, I don't, I'm not going to put this big number here. Let's wait. And then also, it decre decreases. This is a negative. Let me... Yeah, okay. Force that decreases at a rate of 2 newtons per kilometer. Decreases. So, GMM is 20,000 cubed. Okay, so now we can say df dr at r is equal to 10,000 kilometers 
is equal to minus two twenty thousand cubed over ten thousand cubed, which is minus two twenty thousand over ten thousand cubed. minus two, two cubed, two times two is four, four times two is eight, eight times minus two is minus 16, and that's newtons per kilometer. There we go. That's DFDR at 10,000 kilometers. If, given this, this that, the, that the force decreases the rate of two newtons per kilometer when R is equal to 20,000 kilometers.